my story began when I was 13, when a close family friend who was like an uncle to me actually passed from pancreatic cancer. When the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using the internet, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer. And what I had found really shocked me. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. Why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason our current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique, I mean, that's older than my dad, but also it costs $800 per test and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously uh, suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this test. And so I was a bit fed up with this, and so armed with freshman biology, I decided to set out to change cancer diagnostics. <laughs> bit lofty of a goal, however, I was going to do it. And I found what a sensor for pancreatic cancer would really have to look like in order to be effective. It would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And there's a reason why we haven't updated this test in over six decades. And that's because when you're looking for the cancer, we're looking at your bloodstream, particularly for these variations in the amount of protein there. And while this sounds really straightforward, it's anything but. Because essentially, you have liters and liters of blood that's already abundant in protein, and you're looking for this tiny amount of protein that has a minuscule difference in its levels. It's next to impossible. It's like trying to buy a needle in a sack of nearly identical needles. <laughs> However, undeterred due to my teenage optimism, or how some people label complete ignorance of the entire field, <laughs> I went to any teenager's best source for information, Google, Wikipedia, how I get through every high school test and quiz. <laughs> and I stumbled across a database of over 8,000 different proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have these different cancers. And it was summer break, I had nothing else to do, so I decided my summer break would consist of me looking through all 8,000 proteins. By the end of the summer, I was pretty close to losing my sanity and really doubting my potential for any future social interaction. <laughs> it did make for some very interesting back-to-school essays, like, oh, Johnny, what did you do? Oh, I went to Yellowstone. Jack, what did you do? I researched proteins all summer. <laughs> Needless to say, I got a few odd looks from that one. But on the 4,000th try, I finally found one protein that could work. And its name was called mesothion. And mesothion is just your ordinary run-of-the-mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer. In which case, it's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, the key is, is that it's found in the earliest stages of the disease, when something has close to 100% chance of survival. So now that I had found a protein that I, could work, that I could work with, I then shifted my focus to actually detecting that protein and thus the presence of pancreatic cancer. And I kind of had this epiphany moment in this entire journey and where everything all of a sudden came together. And it came in the most unlikely of places. High school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. <laughs> Particularly with my biology teacher. I mean, we did not get along. And one day it had escalated to the point where I was blatantly ignoring her instruction and I snuck in an article in what are called single-walled carbon nanotubes. And these are long, thin pipes of carbon that are an atom thick and 150,000 the diameter of your hair. So they're extremely small, but they have these amazing properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. And while I was feeling really suave reading this under my desk, we were learning about these things called antibodies, which are essentially molecules that only re react with one specific protein, kind of like a lock and key. And in this case, that molecule was the cancer biomarker mesothelium. And I was just reading this article when all of a sudden it hit me. You can combine these two concepts. You see, you take this antibody and you weave it into this network of nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. But also, due to the amazing properties of these nanotubes, the network will actually change how electricity flows with th through it based on the amount of protein present. And hence, I could detect pancreatic cancer using a $50 ohm meter I got off the shelf from Home Depot. And I snatched it from my dad's garage. <laughs> and there's a catch, however. These networks of nanotubes are extremely flimsy. And since they're delicate, they need to be supported. So I chose to use paper. And making a paper sensor for pancreatic cancer is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I love. 
I mean, if I get to be on a test, there goes the chocolate chip cookies, plus some ice cream, depending on how bad it was. <laughs> and essentially, you start with some water, you pour in some nanotubes, add some antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. And it's a, <laughs> it's a bit more complicated than that, however, just as soon as I had this realization, all of a sudden, my biology teacher, I swear she has eyes on the back of her head, she whirls around, she's red in the face, storms up to my desk, snatches this article, and is like waving in my face saying, what is this real science doing in my class for the mundane and regurgitation of facts? At <laughs> least I thought that what she was saying, however, she probably said something along the lines, you need to pay attention. But after 30 minutes of listening to how I need to respect myself and others, I finally got that article back and I could actually begin doing some research. And just as soon as I started this, I realized I'm going to need a lab. You can't have the Andrika Kitchen Countertop Cancer Research Lab. Me and my brother had done some pretty crazy stuff, like we have this big vat of uranium down in our basement. We got that off a sketchy Russian website. And it's right next to some high-grade explosives we cooked up on our kitchen stove. We even cultured E. coli and cholera where we make sandwiches. <laughs> and this has landed us on the FBI watch list. <laughs> However, cancer research wasn't in the family budget, unfortunately. So I needed a lab, and so I sent out 200 emails to professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health. And attached to this, was this 32-page long behemoth of a document essentially stating my procedure, materials, potential pitfalls, everything. And then I thought, oh, I get to sit back waiting for all these positive emails to pour in, I'll get to pick and choose my lab, be hailed on the cover of Time like, boy, genius saves us from cancer. <laughs> then reality struck. I got 199 rejections. And I realized professors, they're not nearly as nice as those glowing profile pictures make them seem. One professor actually went through each line of my procedure saying why it was the worst mistake possible. No clue where he got the time, maybe it's like his hobby instead of like knitting, he does like, let's make fun of 16 year olds. <laughs> but eventually, I got one positive email from Dr. Aaron Bamayetra at Johns Hopkins University. And so I go in three months later for this big interview, I'm expecting like pretty classic interview, like what's your favorite color, what's your favorite class, what's your name? Unfortunately, this guy had an MD and he knew what he was talking about. I couldn't bamboozle him like I could my parents. I just tell my parents, oh, I'm doing cancer research. And they're like, sure, of course you are. <laughs> so I go in and it begins the interrogation. And he decides, let's set a world record for how many postdocs we can stuff in this nine foot by nine foot room. The answer was actually 28 of them. And they were just firing these questions at me. However, an hour later, I stumbled out, I guess, to see like I do on all my SAT questions on the ones I didn't know. <laughs> and finally, I got into the lab space that I needed. And just as soon as I started, I realized I had no clue what I was doing in this lab whatsoever. First day, let's culture some cancer cells, Jack. Oh, I accidentally sneezed in the vial. <laughs> like there are these giant tentacles growing out, but the next day I'm like, oh, I thought it had an immune system. Cancer's pretty hard to kill, right? Mm -mm. Then he like blew it up in the centrifuge. It was very like this glorious fountain of cell culture going everywhere. I thought it was totally worth it. My lab professor, not so much. And finally, after like screwing up every possible procedure for seven months, and this included me staying at the lab overnight quite a lot. I would like take some science journals and spread them out into like this rim shackle like mattress kind of and like put them over and like cry myself to sleep eating a Twix bar like why am I doing this to myself? <laughs> However, eventually I ended up with one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current methods of detection. But also, it can detect the cancer in the earliest stage. When someone has close to 100% chance of survival, and so far as over 90% accuracy. <laughs> so. <laughs> 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 
So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rates from 5.5% to close to 100%, and would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there, because you can switch out that antibody and detect an entirely different protein, meaning an entirely different disease. So that means pretty much any disease in the world, ranging from Alzheimer's to other forms of cancer, even HIV, AIDS, and heart disease. And it could even be broadly extended to things outside of that, like telling what chemotherapy regimen would be most effective, or whether or not your surgery was successful. Even environmental monitoring could be done with this. And throughout this journey, I faced a lot of adversity. I mean, I got told no by 199 professors. My own parents told me no. My biology teacher told me no. I mean, I got told no at every single opportunity. At least they didn't tell me to make a paper mache volcano for my science fair. But one of the greatest adversities I faced were scientific paywalls. You see, 90% of all scientific articles are locked tightly behind these paywalls. And that means when you want to read them, you have to cough up $35. And oftentimes, they don't have anything to do with your research whatsoever. And this was, because of this inhibitive cost, I had to spend thousands of dollars and waste countless hours trying to find these articles. And like any self-respecting teen, I tried to pirate them, but that was pretty unsuccessful. <laughs> and we oftentimes see these big STEM initiatives saying, we need more kids interested in science. However, when the new Katy Perry single costs 99 cents, and a seminal science article costs $35, that's a bit of a mixed message. <laughs> because the world of pop culture and music should be just as accessible as the world of science, because if we don't make science as accessible as music, and we're just going to end up with a bunch of Miley Cyrus's and Kim Kardashian's twerking it out. <laughs> and trust me, they aren't going to solve the world health crisis. <laughs> but this isn't just a problem for 15-year-old cancer researchers. This is a problem for everyone. You see, recently Harvard University released a statement saying that major periodical subscriptions especially to electronic journals published by historically key providers, cannot be sustained. Continuing these subscriptions on their current footing is financially untenable. Now, what does it say about the world of academic publishing, accessibility of knowledge, and the flow of information? When Harvard University, the richest academic institution in the world, can't afford to continue paying its subscriptions, how can you expect kids to be interested in science when a multi-billion dollar institution can't afford them? By instituting these paywalls, we've created a very rigid class system of knowledge classes. We have the knowledge elite, those people who work at corporate labs or big universities who can afford these articles. But there's even a hierarchy there. You see, Harvard and Yale University probably have a lot more money to dish out than University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And the same holds true for, college or for countries, because think of it, the US, we have a lot of money. Ukraine I was recently visiting, and they said, we simply can't afford these articles. We have to pirate them in order to have a career. But then there's the knowledge middle class, people like you and me. We have the internet. We can access the 10% of articles that are open access and read Wikipedia pages. But then there's the knowledge underclass, those who don't have access to the internet, those 5.5 billion people. So that means we're living in a knowledge aristocracy. We're 0.008% of the world. That's the number of people that control and are the only ones who can read these scientific articles. Well, as 80% of the world can't access them whatsoever. So that's like taking 80 people off the streets of, of um, Los Angeles. Those are the only people that can read these articles. Everyone else in LA, too bad for you. But imagine if we could live in a knowledge democracy. But regardless of whether you're from Cambodia to China, Mexico to Malaysia, whether you're a billionaire or living on less than a dollar a day, you'd have the exact same access to scientific articles. Because science isn't a luxury, and knowledge should not be a commodity. It should be a basic human right. Because the minds of the people must be free, and that means the minds of everyone, not the minds of the select few that can afford these articles. Science must be agnostic to how much money you have or where you work, because this tier-based dissemination of information is incredibly detrimental and it simply is not effective. 
because a girl in Pakistan should have just the same access to articles as a preeminent lo Nobel laureate at Harvard University. Not because it's sound economics, but because it's the morally correct thing to do, and that is equality. Because we must dare to be the change that we seek in this world, and we must have the audacity to spread that change. We have to abolish the knowledge middle and under classes. Because if we don't, we further perpetuate a system that discriminates against your access to knowledge on the account of superficial factors, such as where you work, how old you are, and how much money you have. We have the capacity to do this. It's a simple question of whether or not we want to. Our values as a society are not determined by a nature or nature's God. They're determined by our combined forces of our wills. And so I believe that we can do this. Because think, if a 15-year-old who didn't quite know what a pancreas was could find a new way to attack pancreatic cancer, just imagine what we all could do together. Thank you.